All right, welcome back to the listener's commentary on Paul's second letter to the Corinthians. In addition to these audio recordings, there are some other resources available on my website. There's a free ebook on how to read and understand the Bible and apply it to your life. It's right there on the home page of the website. It's completely free. Just put in your name and your email address. You'll get access to that. There's also the Listener's Commentary Study Hub in which I'm providing pictures, maps, occasional special studies, and some of that. And I'm slowly adding some of those to this study of 2 Corinthians as well. And the Study Hub is a great way to support this ministry. So you can give whatever you can afford and you get access to some of those bonus resources as well, as well as to all my online courses. In this recording, we're going to be looking at 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verses 1 through 15. And beginning in this paragraph here of 8, 1 through 15, Paul is actually beginning the second major part of the letter. So the first part of the letter was chapters 1 through 7. And there Paul focused on his relationship to the Corinthians, to their history together, to his ministry among them, to why his ministry looks the way it does all as part of his appeal for them to open wide their heart to him and fully restore and rebuild that relationship. So that was chapters 1 through 7. Now here in chapters 8 and 9, Paul's actually going to focus on a project. It's a project that they had been working on together and that has gone by the wayside a bit, presumably because of the conflict and the tension and the relational breakdown. And what that project is, is a offering or a collection for the Christians living in Jerusalem and the surrounding region, Judea. Paul knows a good number of the Christians in Jerusalem and Judea are poverty-stricken. And we know from history, Paul knew because he was living it, that there was a famine in the region around this time period. And so their poverty was even uh, more deeply intensified. And so about a year earlier, a year before he wrote this letter of 2 Corinthians, Paul had begun this project of collecting funds from various churches that he had started and also uh, recruiting some representatives of those churches to travel with him back to Jerusalem and deliver this offering. Uh, we saw it mentioned at the end of 1 Corinthians, in 1 Corinthians 16, where Paul gave some instructions there concerning this, prior to now kind of restarting it here in 2 Corinthians chapter 8. And the impetus is to care for the needy in the church at Jerusalem. And it's also a way of building bridges between Paul's Gentile churches and the the Jewish believers there in Jerusalem. And so they're collecting funds, but they're also getting representatives from each of the churches, churches in Galatia, churches in Macedonia, churches in Achaia, and sending those representatives with the funds, the money from the, their church uh, to the Christians there in Jerusalem. And what we know is, is that the Corinthians were actually early adopters in this project. They were some of the first to sign on and do it. In fact, Paul will say here in, in this paragraph, this section we're going to look at, that they were like the first or one of the first to actually say yes to this project. And so this has been going on for about a year, and it's broken down a bit because of the relational tension between Paul and the Corinthians. And so now, having spent the last seven chapters kind of welcoming them back and restoring their relationship and appealing to open their heart. Now here in chapter 8 and then into chapter 9, Paul begins to kind of reappeal to them to say, let's, let's ramp this back up again. And so here's what Paul says to them as he appeals to them to get back on board with this project. He says, verse 1, Now, brothers and sisters, we make known to you the grace of God which has been given in the churches of Macedonia, that in a great ordeal of affliction, their abundance of joy and their deep poverty overflowed in the wealth of their liberality or their generosity. Now, recall that Paul is in Macedonia when he writes this letter. That's where he went to find Titus and he met Titus in Macedonia, he got the good report of the Corinthians response, and he began to pen this letter of 2 Corinthians to them. And so, he is in Macedonia, and the churches there are in places like Philippi and Thessalonica and Berea and some of those churches. And Paul says here, as he starts this section, that 
Um, having been in Macedonia, having visited these churches, what he has discovered is that even though they are deeply poverty stricken, they are so full of joy in the gospel that all of that overflowed in a wealth of generosity towards this project there in Macedonia. Notice that he says that the Macedonians are marked by deep poverty. And that word for deep is a word that refers to like extreme or serious. One scholar describes it as like rock bottom poverty. And so he's not saying they have a lot. It's just saying that even though they hardly have anything, they are so full of joy in the gospel and their desire to help their brothers and sisters in and around Jerusalem, that even though they're poverty stricken, they have given with an overflow of generosity. Also pay attention here as Paul starts this section that he refers to the grace of God. I want to make known to you the grace of God which has been given in the churches of Macedonia. And Paul sees this, this wealth of generosity as an expression of grace. And in fact, Paul is going to use this word grace uh, in various senses throughout this whole section. Uh, here it refers to God's kindness or favor. That's the basic meaning of grace. It refers to kindness, favor. And so that's the basic idea. It's going to be used in verse 4 in, in the sense of like privilege. It's also going to be used just for the offering itself as a grace, that is, as a gift. And so he's going to use this word in a variety of senses, but all of it is because it's an overflow of God's grace given to his people. And so here in Macedonia, God's kindness and God's favor is at work in the Macedonian churches, stirring up their hearts to be generous and gracious as well. Paul then goes on in verse 3 and explains this further, describing in more detail the Macedonians' generosity. He says in verse 3, For I testify that according to their ability and beyond their ability, they gave voluntarily. Now, he's going to say more about this, but notice what he says, that they gave beyond their ability and that they did so voluntarily. In fact, the only other place this word voluntarily is used in the New Testament is down in verse 17 of this very chapter, 817. And there it refers to Titus gladly going back to Corinth of his own voluntary choice. And that's the idea. This word voluntarily speaks of a free choice. And that's important to note. This isn't a mandate. Paul's not forcing the Macedonians. He's not going to force the Corinthians. It's not coerced. It's not a mandate. In fact, Paul's going to say very shortly that he doesn't even want the Corinthians to hear his appeal to them as a command. It must be a free choice, freely determined. And so this isn't a forced thing. It's a free choice. But the Macedonians gave, they were so moved and so full of joy and so moved by God's grace that they gave beyond their ability and they did so voluntarily. Verse 4 continues saying, begging us. Notice that. They gave voluntarily and they were so eager for it, begging us with much urging for the favor of participation in the support of the saints. And that word favor there in verse 4 is the word grace, charis, and that has the sense of privilege. For the, the favor, the privilege of participation in the support of the saints. And the word participation is actually koinonia which is the standard word often translated fellowship, but it has the sense of commonness, partnership, being a part of something, being in this together. And they, they were so eager to join up, Paul is saying, that they urged us for the privilege of participating, joining up, being a part of this support, literally this ministry, this service to the saints which refers to the Christians in Jerusalem and Judea. We often think of saints as really holy you know, men and women who've had a statue made out of them. But in the New Testament, it actually just refers to God's people, those set apart as belonging to God. All of us who are in Christ are the saints. So in this case, it, re it refers to the service of the Christians in Jerusalem and Judea. And the Macedonians just really wanted to get on board with that and be a part of that. Paul goes on in verse 5 and says that they actually went even beyond Paul's expectations. Look what he says in verse 5. And this, not as we expected, like they did this, not as we expected, but they first gave themselves to the Lord and to us by the will of God. Like 
this is like a fresh dedication of themselves to the Lord. Yes, this is a way we can demonstrate our faith and faithfulness to the Lord. Let's do it. This is a fresh dedication of themselves to the Lord and not only to the Lord, but to us, that is to Paul and his team for the sake of the Lord's mission through them. So they didn't just give like half-heartedly, like, oh, here's some money, we'll, we'll drop it in the, the bucket. Uh, they didn't give like on autopilot where they just didn't even really think it through. No, they gave themselves to this. They gave themselves to the Lord and to Paul and his team, which really is a great encouragement and a great example to the Corinthians. Remember, Paul has just urged them in, in chapter 7 to open wide their heart to him. Here's a way they can do it. Here's a way they can tangibly and concretely participate in Paul's ministry and his team's ministry and open their heart to them is by ramping back up their eagerness to participate in this offering as well. So that's the example of the Macedonians, and Paul hopes that it will encourage and inspire the Corinthians to really follow suit and do the same thing. So now he turns and speaks directly to the Corinthians about them and their participation in this offering. And so he says in verse 6, so we urge Titus, or we appealed to Titus that as he had previously made a beginning, so he would also complete in you this gracious work. In other words, um, we were so encouraged by the wholehearted approach of the Macedonians that we figured we would send Titus back to you to, to get you back on track. He helped you get started in your, your, maybe the offering, get started in your restoration of your relationship with us. He's coming back to help get this project going again. And so Paul appeals to them and to their sense of honor and excelling in everything he appeals to them to excel in this act of generosity as well. Look what he says in verse 7. But just as you excel in everything, and then Paul lists off some things that you can read about in 1 Corinthians that he knows they were really important to him and they wanted to be really great at in faith, in speaking, in knowledge, and in all earnestness, earnestness and in the love we inspired in you, well, see that you also excel in this gracious work. And these things, faith, speaking, knowledge, and things like that, these were things that had been important to the Corinthians. In fact, they were things that in 1 Corinthians, Paul had to call them out for because they were arguing over those things and kind of creating some divisions and factions around those things. And Paul really here is saying is, here's something that would really be worth you excelling at. In fact, in some ways, this gracious work, as Paul calls it here, is, is something that subverts their values of honor, because rather than promoting themselves, it actually serves other people, lowers themselves for the sake of others. And so Paul says, I want, I want you to excel in this gracious work as well. And literally the word uh, gracious work is just grace. I want you to excel in this grace, this grace of giving, this grace of this offering. Paul goes on to clarify the tone and the motivation for this and what follows. So look at verse 8. He says, I'm not saying this as a command. And we noted that up above, that Paul wants this to be voluntary. It's got to be a free choice. So I'm not saying this as a command, but as proving through the earnestness of others, the sincerity of your love as well. Uh, that word proving is the idea of verifying or validating, right? Like uh, demonstrating the genuineness and the authenticity of it. And so validating through the earnestness of others, the sincerity of your love as well. The, the earnestness of others is the Macedonians. He's using their example, hopefully, to stir up the hearts of the Corinthians so that by their the inspiration of their example, um, it would move the Corinthians to, to get on board and validate their love, their love for the Lord, their love for Paul, their love for their brothers and sisters in Christ in Jerusalem and Judea, right? That it would, it would validate and verify your love as well. And all of this is really an imitation of Jesus and his own self-giving love. And so Paul grounds this in that in verse 9. So look at verse 9. He says, For you know... This is the heart of their faith. This is something they know very well. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, 
Yet for your sake, he became poor so that you, through his poverty, might become rich. And notice Paul has described this as the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. And Paul has just described this collection as grace, and that links this together. So you know the grace of our Lord Jesus. How did that show up? How did his uh, grace show up? Well, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor. That's the pattern. This is the ultimate, not just pattern, but motivation, that following Christ means imitating the cross. And so, for your sake, he became poor so that through your poverty, or through his poverty, you might become rich. And one of the things that means is, if you're going to imitate the pattern of Jesus and his self-giving love, well, that means learning to live a generous, self-giving life as well. And so Paul is grounding this specific action of, of giving to this offering in the cross of Jesus and Jesus' own example of self-giving love. Then Paul goes on in verse 10 and comes back to uh, the Corinthians and this project and says, Now, I give my opinion in this matter, for this is to your advantage, who were the first to begin a year ago, not only to do this, but also to desire to do it. But now... Finish doing it also, so that there may be, so that just as there was the willingness to desire it, there may also be the completion of it by your ability. Now, let's just clarify a few things out of verses 10 and 11. Paul says, I give my opinion in this matter. And that translation, I just think, is a little bit too weak, the word opinion. In English, the word opinion means that it's just kind of something I think about. There's really no evidence. It's more of just sort of a suggestion. And that just seems like too weak of a word for what Paul is actually saying here. Here, this word opinion stands in contrast to the word command in verse 8. I'm not commanding you to do this, but I give my opinion. And the word opinion really is judgment. I give my reasoned thinking on this. In other words, I'm not commanding you, but I am giving you a, uh, a reasoned judgment about this matter. That's the idea. So it's not a command, but, but I've thought this through, and it really is to your advantage. That is to your benefit to, to jump back on board with this, um, because you pledged to do this a year ago. You, in fact, you were eager and desired to do it a year ago. You were the first one to, to adopt on. Uh, but you haven't finished it, and there's reasons for that, but now we can get back to it. So let's finish doing it, he says, so that just as there was a, a willingness to desire it, there could also be the completion of it by your ability. And that's important as well, by your ability. He's going to talk more about this in what follows, but the idea of by your ability, it'll become clear is meaning give what you can. Don't feel like you have to give as much as somebody else. Don't feel like you have to make yourself poverty stricken to do it. Just give what you're able. That's the idea of your ability. So bring this to completion by just doing what you're able to do. He goes on to explain further in verse 12 and says, For if the willingness is present, it's acceptable according to what a person has, not according to what he does not have. So give what you're able, because if you're doing it out of a willing and a good heart, then it's acceptable and pleasing to God. And specifically, he says it's acceptable according to what a person has, not according to what he doesn't have. So give what you're able to give. You know what you're able to give. Don't compare with others. Don't worry about it. That's the idea. For, verse 13, continuing to explain, for, for this is not for the relief of others and for your hardship but by way of equality. That's a really important statement. Notice what he says. The goal is not for you to give so much now that you have crushing needs. No, that's not the goal. The goal is to take whatever extra you might have and be able to share it with those who don't even have enough. That's the idea of what he's getting at here. So that there could be equality. Uh, so there could be enough for everybody. And so Paul explains in verses 14 and 15, and he does so with a principle from the Old Testament, from the story of the Exodus. And so he explains further and says um, that there might be equality at the present time. Your abundance will serve as assistance for their needs. So your abundance, you've got more than enough. 
So share some with them because they've got uh, great needs so that their abundance also may serve as an assistant for your need. We're all in this together. They're your brothers and sisters. Right now, you've got some extra, share with them. Someday, when they maybe have some extra and you have a need, they can return the favor and share with you. And then he restates, so that there may be equality. The equality doesn't mean sameness. The equality means mutual benefit, mutual help of each other, that we all might take care of each other and there might be enough. So not that we all have the same amount, but we all at least have enough. And then he goes on in verse 15 to base that in an Old Testament uh, passage, an Old Testament story. So he says, as it is written, the one who had gathered much did not have too much. And the one who had gathered little did not have too little. That's from Exodus chapter 16, verse 18. It's in reference to the gathering of the manna in the story of the Exodus. And the gathering of the manna, they, they only gathered what their family needed for the day. So each day, depending on the size of the family, they would gather just what their family's needs were for the day. And the point was to trust God rather than to hoard a whole bunch of extra for themselves. Um, and God would provide enough for everybody based on what their needs were. And so Paul says that really is the principle we're working on here. Your abundance can help meet their need. Someday when they have extra, they can help meet your need so that there is equality. That is, there's enoughness to go around. Everybody has what they need. Now, Paul has a lot more to say about the offering. There's going to be some logistical matters that come up very quickly. Then he's going to give some more appeals in chapter 9. But let's pause here with this one and just offer a couple reflections. And the first is this. Just pay attention to how Paul fundraises, if you want to call it that here. He emphasizes free choice. He doesn't even want them to hear it as a command. He doesn't want it to be forced in any sort of way. But he does want to inspire them. He does appeal to them. He does appeal to their sense of honor, their value of honor. He does appeal for generosity, but not so much generosity that them now themselves face financial hardship. And he grounds his appeal in the self-giving example of Jesus because it's all got to be gospel-shaped and gospel-centered. And so since Jesus acted this way, this is the king's way. Let's act that way as well. Now, we'll see more of Paul's approach in chapter 9 as he makes more appeals there. But that's just helpful for us to see. Here's Paul uh, ramping up a project, specifically a fundraising project, not for his benefit, but for the Christians in Jerusalem. And here's how he goes about it. The other reflection is this, and that is generosity is grace at work. The emphasis on grace here, the emphasis on Jesus' grace is the pattern and the motivation for our grace of giving. Generosity is grace at work. And so God's grace being poured out in us and through us and at work in us moves us to participate in gracious ways in caring for the needs of other people. And so uh, Christians are generous people because of the grace of God at work in our lives. And in that spirit, let me just say a huge thank you to those of you who support this ministry by your gracious generosity, by the work of God's grace in you. I am always moved and deeply encouraged whenever uh, I see your generosity at work and I see your gifts come through. And so I thank God for you because you are imitating the grace of God at work in Jesus Christ by being generous to this ministry, and it's having an impact on people all around the world, people that you and I may never meet face to face, but God is using your generosity to help them learn the scriptures and grow in faith. And for that, we say thank you, and we can celebrate God and his work in and through us together. So thanks a ton for your support. And if you want to join the team of supporters, the easiest way to do that is to go to listenerscommentary.com, click the Give button. It'll take you to a page where you can put in a dollar amount, click a little box that says Make This Monthly, or you can leave that box unclicked and just give a one-time gift as well. So thanks a ton for your support. May God bless you for it.